how in the face of provable ignorance do you go forward? Yeah, let's get into our first theme, the question of whether science can provide ultimate answers to questions about the mind. I'd like to start with you, Ellen, because in your published work, you say something a little bit different, or you come down a little bit harder than perhaps you suggested there, where you want to rule out types of dualism. So I just want to ask you, why don't you think dualism would offer a solution to the problem of consciousness? And why well, do you think science I, I mean is better placed? Well, primarily because uh, of the problem that Tamara suggested, that uh, the, the proverbial mind-body problem. How do you get from something immaterial, a thought, to something material called the body? And uh, I don't think that we're going to be able to solve that. And um, I don't think, as I've said already, we need to wait to solve that. Once we take the mind and body and put them back together, then we have enormous control over our, our health, wherever we put our mind, so too will be our body. It doesn't mean things aren't happening under the hood. It means that uh, they're happening more or less simultaneously rather than sequentially. You know, so the question now you might be asking, you have this thought and this thought leads to this and this leads to this and so on. And, and that's a chain of events I don't think um, is going to prove useful. Um, and I also think that we need to be careful when we talk about science, because I think that uh, as a scientist, I say this, um, that a lot of the misconceptions we have come from our science. Um, not the the practice, of, well, the more the practice of the science rather than the theory of the science. Science, uh, our experiments only give us probabilities. These probabilities are taken as absolutes. And that's when we get into trouble. Um, so that even if we were going to use our studies to come up with uh, an understanding of what constitutes consciousness, we're not going to have absolute answers. We're never going to have that final answer. Um, essentially, I think that everything that's wrong in this world this is a very big statement I'm going to make. I'm not sure I should, but I mean this, that all of our personal problems, interpersonal problems, professional problems, um, global problems are the result directly or indirectly of our mindlessness. And um, it's our mindlessness, our thinking we know um, that prevents uh, actions that may in fact be much more to our benefit. Um, it's the thinking we know that um, prevents us from looking for cures for certain diseases, from recognizing things that we're able to do that we're not even aware of right now. Uh, on a side note, we have a culture that um, you have professionals, my colleagues, I have a great deal of respect for all the work that they do, but they tend to get you from bad to better. And I think almost always there's a better than better. Um, and um, some of this comes about through science, you know, the science says this, and then you stop looking. Um, I can give many examples if you want any of the better to better. But um, um, so I think that if we understand science as it is, which is a suggestion of possibilities, probabilities, not absolutes, then I don't see how we can use science to prove an absolute understanding of consciousness mm. or anything else. How, how are we going to demonstrate now we know what we're talking about? If the only means we have to do those demonstrations are probabilities. Mm. Sean, would you share the sentiment? Is it a matter of probability? And perhaps you could say something a little bit about uh, maybe the core theory and, and how you might think that placing our bets on physical science and the core theory is, is the best way to go in terms of probability. Yeah, you know, I do mostly agree with everything Ellen just said, but just for the sake of a debate, I will try to imagine <laughs> a disagreement and, and, you know, locate it somewhere. Um, I think that there's, I don't see any difference in the future prospects for understanding consciousness than for other questions that we have about the natural world. 
I think it's in the nature of science that, as Ellen said, we get probabilities. We say that something becomes more and more likely over time, but any good scientist should be willing to revise their beliefs in various hypotheses if new evidence comes in down the road. And you can only do that if, you're, if your credence in that idea is not either zero or one, according mm -hmm. to Bayes' theorem. So we should always imagine that we do better and better, but never perfectly. That's true with physics and chemistry and biology. It's also true with consciousness, and that's fine. But we can do really, really well, right? We can have such confidence in some beliefs that we kind of no longer worry about them not being true, even though technically they might very well be. And I think when you mentioned the core theory that there's certain ideas in physics that people quite haven't quite appreciated how solidly understood they are. You know, we talk about quantum mechanics and atoms and particles and so on. There are absolutely mysteries there that we don't know the answer to yet. We don't understand the fundamental foundations of quantum mechanics. We don't understand quantum gravity, what happened at the Big Bang, the black holes, dark matter. There's a long list of things we don't understand. But that doesn't mean we understand nothing. And there's something we understand. There are many things we understand in the sense that even if we get a deeper understanding someday, these things are not going to go away. Just like when uh, Isaac Newton came up with his theory of gravity, Kepler's laws didn't go away. When Einstein came up with his theory of gravity, Newton's laws didn't go away. They were shown to only be approximations valid in a certain regime, and that very well might happen with what we call the core theory, which is the theory of the fundamental fields that go into the you and me and the world around us, the electrons and quarks and uh, photons and gluons and so forth. We have very, very, very good reason to believe that we're not missing any ingredients at the level of quantum field theory or particle physics that could possibly affect us biologically or psychologically. So I would think that there's a huge credence that we should all have, that the fundamental physics underlying us and our everyday lives is actually understood, that there will be plenty of future surprises in physics, but they'll be about the Big Bang and the origin of the universe and dark matter and cosmology, they won't be about the atoms that make up you and me. We understand the mm. physics behind them perfectly well. How they group together to make complicated things, we don't understand that at all. There's plenty of room for that. Don't worry. But we still know what the atoms are. Well, just let me push back slightly before I invite Tamar to comment and then back to Ellen perhaps for her response. It's, it's quite odd to me that we don't have a a philosopher of, of mind or a strict uh, philosopher of mind on a panel concerning the uh, question of the uh, question of the mystery of consciousness, let's say. But if there was one here, Sean, they might say to you, well, there is something we're missing at the baseline within the core theory. And that's something that's qualitative and not quantitative. It's a very different sort of thing. The feeling of red compared to or the experience of seeing red in comparison to so red is conveyed in the language of physics, let's say. You can't get the feeling and experience of seeing red from uh, your science textbook. It's not, it's not the same sort of thing. It's a radically different sort of ontological entity. How would you push back against that, uh, that general uh, style of argument? Yeah, well, as you said at the beginning, it's actually not most philosophers who would make that argument. Most philosophers are happy physicalists about consciousness and the brain. But there is a vocal minority who have arguments, which, by the way, are essentially always philosophical arguments mm. that say that physics and physicalism are not going to be up to the task of ultimately accounting for our subjective first-person experiences. And against that, I have a couple of things. One is just, as I said, the trivial observation that consciousness is really hard, very complicated. Of course, it's something we don't understand yet. That means almost nothing at all. Secondly, as I've already said, the evidence for the success of physics in describing the behavior of the stuff of which we are made is incredibly strong. Mm. So basically, you're left with two choices. If you want there to be something other than the physical stuff that helps us account for subjective experiences or something like that, then either that something else has to change the laws of physics 
or not change the laws of physics. I think those are the only two choices. I've, I've talked with logicians. They back me up on this. Either you change the laws of physics or you don't change the laws of physics. And if you do change the laws of physics, good. I mean, I think you're playing the game fairly in that case, but it's super hard to change the laws of physics. We have really good evidence about how stuff works and very good theoretical principles on which, which it's based. If you don't change the laws of physics, if you just say, sure, the atoms making up you and me obey exactly the equations we think they do and they behave exactly in the ways that we think they should, but I would like to overlay them with some extra words about the mind, I mean, knock yourself out. I kind of just don't care <laughs> because the physical behavior of us, remember, includes every word we say, every thing that we speak out loud, every gesture, every declaration of love, every ouch that we proclaim when we get hurt, right? Those are physical behaviors. So if you think that physics is doing the job of physics at explaining those physical behaviors, that I don't see the need for anything else over and above that. Hmm. Tamar, do you want to come in on this point? Yeah, I want to come in and represent wearing the philosophy hat what the philosophical question is here, and I want to do it by way of making an analogy. So many of the listeners are familiar with the problem of what's often called external world skepticism. That is, do I know that the reality beyond my perceptual experience is what is giving rise to my perceptual experience, as opposed to something which is radically uncorrelated with my perceptual experience. That is, does the world beyond my perceptual experience exist? The minute you raise that question, and there are versions of the question raised in the ancient Greek tradition, in Sextus Empiricus, there are versions of the question raised famously in the writings of Descartes in the Meditations, there are versions of this question raised in any wisdom tradition. Once you raise that question, nothing that counts as ordinary evidence could bear on your answer to that question. It's a question, how can I know that what I take to be evidence of something is in fact evidence of that thing? So Sean can come and tell us every single fact about physics. Ellen can come and tell us every single fact about psychology. None of those will have bearing as a response to a global skeptical hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Now, Philosophers have spent thousands of years trying to figure out whether the articulation of such a hypothesis makes sense, right? You might have a view whereby it is only in a state of confusion that you can set forward the skeptical hypothesis. You don't know what you mean by it. There are various answers that have been given to it. Descartes tries to derive it from first principles, first about the nature of subjectivity and then about the status of a divine being as creator of the world. But in the end, there is nothing specific that could be an answer to the skeptical hypothesis. The only thing that could be an answer to the skeptical hypothesis is some general claim about the nature of understanding and reality. The question about consciousness is a similarly skeptical question in the sense that there's no particular fact that could be relevant to its answer. Here are three things that are undeniable. The more we learn about physics, the more we learn about how human beings behave. Two, Ellen's done all sorts of really cool studies where behavior seems to affect the physical. Three, we all have subjective experience with regard to which we seem to have evidence and no evidence could we ever have about anybody else's subjective experience. These three things hold simultaneously and in some sense the challenge is how in the face of provable ignorance do you go forward? Hmm. Ellen, can I just bring you back in before we move to our second <laughs> no, theme? No. The, a couple of <laughs> remarks there from, from Tamara and Sean. Uh, one which, from your book, and Tamara mentioned some of these fascinating studies that you talk about across your books. It seems that reading quite naively into it, regarding philosophy of mind you, someone might read it and go well look like this is the the mind changing the way these physical particles operate within a person 
Like, do you see, in answer to Sean's question, do you see the power of the mind within the body as one, just underlying physical processes, or two, do you think it can somehow manipulate and change the way these particles are operating within the body? <laughs> I believe it can change. Um, that's, you know, the nature of everything that I've said is that things can change. Sean said, uh, sure, there may be some surprises, but not with respect to the most elemental aspects of physics. So we'll wait and see if that surprise comes his way as well. I, I think if we looked at, um, over uh, science, whether it's physics by any science, um, probably also true in philosophy, Tamara, but the last time I studied philosophy, I, you know, it was 50 years ago, so I'm not even going to try to go there. But um, I think that uh, at each point in time, there are people who are certain of the facts that they've read, uh, the things that they're studying. And, um, you know, so um, Sean says, you know, atoms are atoms, but it's my very naive understanding that every few years we discover a different part of the atom and we get something smaller and smaller. I don't know after the quark, what, you know, but um, so do you think that you found the smallest um, particle um, and if not, could that new finding chain, change everything? To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.